right, good evening everyone. Great to see you. It's our last lecture in the Old Testament. And uh, thank you for coming and thank you for hanging in there for all of these eight weeks. Well, seven weeks now, the eighth is tonight. And I trust that you will enjoy bringing the Old Testament study to a close. What I want to do as we uh, start with a short devotion tonight is read from the second last book, the book of Zechariah. There's some wonderful, wonderful stories in uh, the prophets. If you really took, if you take time to actually go through the prophets, you'll uh, see them, you'll discover them. Some of them really give us some insight into a prophetic word into the future. We've said that uh, the prophets, by and large, spoke into their own current contemporary situation. But there are times when their messages really reached forward into the future. And um, Zechariah chapter 3 is a vision. In fact, the few, first couple of chapters of, first few chapters of Zechariah uh, contain several visions that the prophet had. And we'll look at his historical context in a moment. Um, but he with Haggai uh, were encouraging the people to rebuild the nation, to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the nation after the return from the exile. And in chapter 3, in a vision, Zechariah saw the following. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. So once again, one of those uh, mysteries, as we said in Job chapter 1, when you find Satan in front of, uh, or in the presence of God, with the sons of God, they are called in Job. Here is a, a visionary picture but we have a similar kind of a picture, and that is that Satan is there in the presence of God. In fact, the word Satan, Satan in Hebrew, actually means accuser. And so uh, here is, is Satan also in the presence of the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire, and that's a reference to Joshua the priest, the high priest. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head. And they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among these standing here. Listen, O high priest Joshua and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. And um, the branch, the word branch here in the NIV is spelled with a capital B. In the Hebrew, there were no capital or lowercase. It was just one single uh, script. And so obviously, out of the context, one needs to determine how you will translate this. And the NIV translators opted to use the, the capital B for branch. And I think correctly so, because it is reaching into the future. And to me, it's such a beautiful picture. If I put myself in Joshua's place and I appear before God, I have nothing to offer him. All I have to offer God is filthy rags, really. I have nothing good in me to offer God to impress him. And so unless God reaches out by his grace, which, he, which this picture actually um, displays for us, and touches my life, as he touched Joshua, I really would be lost. And so in this particular picture, the rags, the filthy clothes, are replaced by wonderful, beautiful garments. And then great promises are made to Joshua, the high priest. This is visionary material. We've, we've got to recognize that for, uh, the first of all. But there is a message here. There's a message of hope for Joshua, for the nation, that God wants to reach out and touch them that God by His grace is not only willing, but He is able to forgive our sins. Now, if you then look down, and there's this reference to the branch, uh, 
uh, with a capital B. Somewhere in the future, we believe, and uh, we're looking back now, we, we say that Jesus came and He was that branch, He was that rock, He was that promise, He was the uh, Messiah who came into this world. And as He died, He made the way for us clear and opened the way for us to actually enter into the presence of God. And here I'm standing, I have nothing to offer God, but Jesus died for me and His, sin, his blood is able to wash away all my sin. And He replaces whatever is filthy uh, in my life with something beautiful that is now acceptable to God only because Jesus now lives in me. When God looks at me, He looks at Jesus. He doesn't see my sins anymore because Jesus died for my sins. That's what it means to be reconciled with God. That's what it, mean, that what, that's what it means when, when we say that Jesus came to, to atone for our sins. He died in our place so that He can offer us a, a clean life so that we can enter into the presence of God. What a wonderful privilege. And uh, it's all there in the Old Testament, and which is why I said to you on several occasions, the New Testament really takes on new significance when you start reading the Old Testament and you read the New Testament against the background uh, of the Old Testament and the light that the Old Testament can shine upon the New. And vice versa. When we get to the New Testament, you then really begin to understand the Old Testament much better. You then feel sorry for those who get stuck into the Old Testament and they don't have the New Testament picture to complete the picture. Because for us, the picture has been completed. God has painted the whole picture and has given it to us uh, in His Word, uh, which is a wonderful privilege. So let's pray together as we get into the Word uh, and into our study tonight. We thank You, Lord, for giving us this opportunity. I thank You that You have brought us so far Thank you for this journey through the Old Testament. And somehow we feel like the information is, is overwhelmingly much. Too much for us to really take in and comprehend. But I pray that you would help us as we uh, come to a conclusion and draw this study to a c conclusion uh, now today. That you would uh, give us insight, give us understanding and then give us a far better appreciation for who you are and for what you do and the way that you have worked years before Jesus came, and then also as you prepared the way in and through the Old Testament era for the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ the Messiah. Thank you that now, 2,000 years later, Lord, we can look back and we can thank you for what Jesus did for us on that cross. Thank you that you have forgiven us. Thank you that we can have free access to God through Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Bless us tonight, and bless us as we take a break from our of uh, course, as we uh, uh, prepare for the next module. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, um, we're coming to the end of our uh, Old Testament study. Only four more books to go. And this is our last lecture in the Old Testament survey. And uh, we'll be looking at uh, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi tonight. And by approaching the last three prophets, we're entering into an, another historical phase. And that is, after 538, or around about 538, the Persian Empire took over from the Babylonian Empire. And Cyrus, the first king of the Persian Empire, gave permission to all the nations to go back to their home countries. And so many people took that opportunity to go home. Others remained, as we have seen in Ezekiel and in Daniel, the book of Esther. Uh, those are just some of the people, Nehemiah and Ezra. Many people remained in Babylon because in a certain sense it became home for them. But many others took that opportunity to actually go home. And um, the prophets that we are now looking at, apart from Zechariah, uh, we'll be going back on the timeline in Zechariah. But when we get to the last three, we're actually looking at the situation back in Jerusalem uh, with the encouragement of Haggai and Zechariah in particular to rebuild uh, the temple which became known as the Second uh, Temple. I do want to encourage you to review all the books of the Old Testament. Those who are writing an exam today uh, have done so. And I'm sure it was to their own benefit. Because if you go back, uh, if you're like me at least, uh, you will for forget. You will forget what is it that we actually studied in maybe in Ezra or in Kings or back in Deuteronomy and so on. So doing a bit of a survey uh, of that and being a revision of those books will help you tremendously. But that's the historical section. Uh, 
It's particularly when we get to the, the prophets. So those um, 16 prophets that we have been looking at and will be looking at tonight, they, 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 they're very difficult to, to place and to plot in your mind, to say, oh, okay, I know Habakkuk is about this, or uh, Haggai uh, served in that generation, or whatever. So I do encourage you from time to time to go through the history of the Old Testament so that you can plot and place the prophets against their own uh, background. Now, before we look at Zechariah, just a couple of thoughts uh, to try and complete the picture once again. I've said much of this before, but uh, the Jewish people call their Bible what we refer to as the Old Testament, the Tanakh. Uh, T-N-K stands for the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. And so, for short, uh, they use the, the acronym Tanakh. And when we look at the Nevi'im uh, in the Old Testament, the prophets in the Old Testament or in the Jewish Bible, they have a different order. They also have fewer in number because they combine several of the books. But in the Jewish canon, this is the second major section of the Hebrew Scriptures. And included in the Nevi'im or in the prophetic section in the Hebrew canon are also the early prophets, as they call them, and then the later prophets. The contents and the order of the writing prophets or the so-called later prophets are the same as that in our uh, Christian canon. And when you look at the Hebrew canon or the Jewish canon, then you will find early prophets, um, and there are four of them. That's Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And uh, as you know by now, uh, Samuel and Kings are combined, so there's no first and second uh, Samuel or Kings in the Jewish canon. And then the later prophets include Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Those are the major prophets. And then the twelve. So there are only five books in the later prophets. And they combine the twelve into one single section. And that's all the, the prophets that we have been studying in the last uh, couple of weeks. We will then look at Zephaniah. Um, the prophet who announced judgment on Judah and the nations, going all the way back to the 7th uh, century, um, and just before the Babylonians took over from the Assyrians. Uh, so on a timeline, we're back in the Assyrian Empire stage, and the latter part of the 7th century BC. In terms of the prophet Zephaniah, I don't know how many of you can immediately quote anything from uh, Zephaniah, but his name means Yahweh or Yahweh has hidden. It's perhaps a reference to the conditions when he was born. Uh, perhaps his parents had some kind of a, a real struggle and God wasn't coming through for them, or so they thought. And so they named their son Yahweh was hidden. So it's not a, a particularly good name to bear necessarily. But he is the only prophet who traces his genealogy. Uh, n none of the other prophets did that. And so if you go back to Zephaniah chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Several other prophets would mention their, their father or something like that, uh, or where they came from. But here we have a fairly extensive, compared to some of the others, geneal genealogy. There are scholars who believe that the Hezekiah, the reason why Hezekiah is mentioned is the possibility that Hezekiah was in his line, in his genealogy. Hezekiah the king. That would make him um, a part of the royal family at the time and probably also a resident of Jerusalem. But that we have to guess because we simply don't know. He was a contemporary of the prophet's uh, Jeremiah placing him in the time of Josiah the king, um, as you will see, uh, during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon. And therefore, he and, and Jeremiah would have lived roughly uh, the same time. Jeremiah lived through the change from the Assyrian Empire to the Babylonian Empire, and then ultimately the Babylonians coming in 586 and destroying Jerusalem. Uh, it's not clear. In fact, it doesn't look like Zephaniah lived that long. So he probably ended roughly... Uh, round about the time of the first uh, conquest of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 609 or maybe just so shortly before. But he did uh, notice or he would have known about the fall of Nineveh, the capital city of the Assyrians. And so he would know about the threat of the Babylonians pushing uh, down south to come uh, their way. Josiah, 
um, the king was responsible for some major reforms. If you go back to Second Chronicles chapter 34, uh, you will find roughly 622 would be the date that Josiah, he was a child when he became king, and as he grew up, he was guided by the high priest, uh, and, and they helped him to serve God, to restore the temple and the worship in the temple. Um, and since Zephaniah was very critical of the Baal worship of his day, in fact, when you go to the book of Zephaniah, it's quite critical uh, in terms of judgments uh, pronounced or announced upon the nation. There, there, it's possible that Josiah was actually encouraged by the ministry of Zephaniah to do the reforms or to be responsible for the reforms uh, that he brought about. A date round about 627 for the prophet's ministry and writings would fit the religious problems with, uh, uh, in those days with a weakening Assyria at that time and a stronger Babylon uh, coming up upon the scene. And as I said, ultimately uh, Babylonia take, took over in 612. That's when Nineveh fell. And then they came down south in a few years. And by 609, 605 or so, they took Jerusalem as well and then ultimately destroyed the city. Part of the background to the book, Manasseh, who reigned or ruled from 697 to 642, introduced major evil and idolatry in the kingdom of Judah. In fact, it is quite horrific when you read the story there. It sometimes blows my mind that you can have a person who is a Jew, had access to the word of God, the temple was just up the hill, as it were, from the palace, and everything around that. And yet, they turned to worship the Baals, they sacrificed their sons to all the idols, and do all sorts of horrific, horrific things, uh, causing God to speak to the nation through uh, prophets like uh, Zephaniah and others. His evil son Ammon reigned for just a short while before Josiah, the child of seven or eight years, became king. Zephaniah preached the message of judgment. If you start reading, uh, you will find that very, very soon in the book it says, I will sweep everything, away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord in verse 2 of chapter 1. I will sweep away both men and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. The wicked will have only heaps of rubble when I cut off man from the face of the earth. And then, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place every remnant of Baal, the names of the pagan and idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord, and who also swear by Molech. And, and so the list goes on in terms of judgment on the nation. And, and if you read, not even just between the lines, you, you hear some of the problems in the nation, worshipping Baal, worshipping Molech, uh, and all those idols of the nations around. Some of the contents, the entire book, almost the entire book of Zephaniah is filled with pronouncements of judgment. And then typically, as we've now become very accustomed um, and used to, right at the end there's a sign of hope. There's light at the end of the tunnel. And so when you go down to chapter 3, verse 9, for example, it starts by saying, um, in just the previous verse, the whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. That's all judgment, all the way to 3, verse 8. 3, verse 9. Then will I purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve Him shoulder to shoulder from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. Uh, again, it's a bit of a reach into the future because in the New Testament you get the picture of the nations coming together and you go to the book of Revelation and you have people from every tongue and nation and tribe coming together before the throne and worshipping God. And that's the picture of the New Testament which was supposed to have been already in the Old Testament but it didn't happen that particular way. So there's a sign of hope right at the end. When you look at the message of Zephaniah, uh, his prophecies were directed at Judah, which is quite obvious because the north was no longer uh, in existence. He believed that the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, was fast approaching. Um, and all the way from, from chapter 1, verse 14, for several verses, it's all about the day of the Lord. We've now picked this pick picked up this uh, theme several times in the prophets, and that is, we expect the day of the Lord. The Lord is going to come through for us, and the prophets again and again come and say, no, 
It's not a day of glory. It's actually a day of judgment. And so that's what you find over here. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry on the day of the Lord will be bitter. The shouting of the warrior there. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. So it's quite a black picture, a dark picture that is painted here by uh, Zephaniah. The only way out is repentance. Gather together, gather together, O shameful nation, before the appointed time arrives and that day sweeps on like chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes on you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what He commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. So there's a call uh, on the nation to repent. And then he includes prophecies against other nations. Uh, Philistia is mentioned. Uh, Moab, Ammon, Cush. And Cush is the upper regions of Africa, more, more or less Egypt or those regions there. Assyria, all those nations are also included in short little sections in the book. And then the promise of restoration. I've made some comments about the day of the Lord before, but the concept of the day of the Lord is probably better described as a time and not one particular day. I think most of us would be very comfortable with that. That's probably in our minds anyway. Um, as opposed to one single 24-hour day. Uh, we do believe that Jesus will come back, for example, and it will happen instantaneously. So obviously on any given day, uh, the Lord Jesus may come back or will come back. But as you go back, and in terms of my, my former picture that I uh, sketched even on the whiteboard with multiple fulfillments, it's no doubt that the day of the Lord had multiple fulfillments both in the Old Testament, in the New Testament itself, and there's another day of the Lord that will happen. And for us, perhaps on a personal level, there may be a mini day of the Lord if you wish. Uh, for some of us, there may be a day of judgment or a day of disaster that may happen to us. It may be that God will speak to us in that particular way. But the time of the Lord is when God will come back in His fullness and God will restore His original intention with the world. And uh, that's been in the minds of the Old Testament believers. It's been in the mind of New Testament believers. Jesus actually came to fulfill that promise and... Um, and in the book of Hebrews and then also in the book of Revelation, you find that reference to there's still a future time, even for us, when everything will be submitted to Jesus Christ. And Jesus will come back and that final, final, final day would then have arrived. And from that day on, it will be the time of the Lord and the kingdom of God will be uh, forever. Um, Judah and Israel always expected the day of the Lord to bring victory, as I said before. Um, but in most cases, they, the prophets interpreted that as judgment on the nation. And the fall of Jerusalem was a, the day of the Lord. Uh, we saw in Joel, even the, uh, uh, the plague, the locust plague, was the day of the Lord that came for them. So anything and everything related to those disasters became fulfillments of the day of the Lord. Um, it's not a long book, and so I suggest that you read the whole book. However, I have highlighted uh, chapter 1, verses 2 to 9. That's the judgment. I've read part of that. Chapter 2, verse 3, the call to repentance. And then the, promise, uh, the promised restoration is a beautiful section uh, in the book of Zephaniah. Then as we um, go to the last three uh, prophets in the Old Testament, we're looking at the post-exilic prophets in Judah and the prophetic activity after the return from the exile. Perhaps um, uh, I need to just remind you on a timeline, we're talking about um, the fall of Jerusalem in 586. And if you, if you then jump forward, the people were in exile, many people were in exile. There were still people in the land of Israel, some Jews living in Israel uh, at the time, or in Judah. Uh, but this is where Ezekiel was, pro was prophesying. Jeremiah lived during that same time. Daniel, um, you, you need to read Esther against that same background. And then towards the end of uh, the book of Second Chronicles, we have the Persian Empire and Cyrus the king coming onto the scene, giving permission for people to go back. That happened in 538 when the exiles were given permission to go back. And then you pick up the story in the book of Ezra. Ezra tells us how some people started going back to Jerusalem. They immediately started building the temple. 
Um, in fact, the first thing they did was to restore uh, the, uh, the altar, and they started sacrificing once again. The only place where the Jews are allowed to actually sacrifice, they will never sacrifice anywhere else, which is why even today they don't sacrifice, because the temple is not restored for them. So they, they built the altar once again, and then they started rebuilding the temple, and then there was opposition. By now the country was divided into different province, provinces. Uh, there was the province of Samaria, and further north, and some other provinces representing some of those other nations, r- roughly, that we have seen, the Moabites and the Ammonites and all those around Israel. But everyone was, uh, was a sort of a, a province with a governor governing on behalf of, uh, first of all, the Babylonians, but now we're reaching into the Persian era. And so these people represented the Persian government by governing. Nehemiah was such a governor. When he came to Judah, he, he was the governor of the province of Judah. In the north, in Samaria, the province of Samaria, there was Sanballat. He was a governor representing Persia. And so Sanballat and several others uh, during the time of Nehemiah opposed the Jews. But even back when they started rebuilding uh, the temple, there was opposition by some of these neighboring people. And so the Jews stood up to them. Uh, They wrote to the king. The king then stopped it, uh, the building of the temple. It took them several years, and it was only by 515. So do the calculation. From 538, they started building the temple, but they had to stop. It was only in 515 that they were able to dedicate the temple. And you need to read Haggai and um, Zechariah. In the, during that particular time with the temple not yet being built and yet um, they have started with the walls of the temple already uh, during that time. So that's what you need to see. Um, this is our very familiar slide now with the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Age and the Persian Age and the different uh, prophets uh, who prophesied and ministered in, in Israel and Judah. And then all the way down, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. We're not going to look at Joel. Um, I believe that's probably the right place to put him or to place him, but we're only looking at those three uh, for now. These prophets and their ministries date from uh, the time after the return, um, and they faced major, major difficulties. When they arrived home, uh, the people in the meantime, for those uh, 50, 60, or if you go all the way back to the first uh, exile, Uh, You're talking a roughly 70-year period. It seems like nobody really cared too much about building. In fact, uh, they were either too scared or too weak, or they had opposition in terms of trying to rebuild. Uh, And any attempt at the time would have been looked upon as a rebellion um, because the Babylonians were in control, and they were the ones who destroyed it. So if you tried to rebuild it, uh, you you would have been in trouble. Now they had permission to go back and to rebuild Jerusalem. And so they started, but then they slowed down when there was a bit of opposition. And they found um, the, the whole place in shambles, as it were, among the first Jewish exiles to return in 538 or 537 uh, were Sheshbazar. Uh, you read about him in Ezra chapter 1, verse 8. And then also Zerubbabel. We read more about Zerubbabel. And the identity of Sheshbazar remains completely uncertain. It's a much debated topic. Um, he's not mentioned elsewhere so that one can re- work out who he was. He's simply mentioned in Ezra, but then he disappears off the scene uh, completely. Zerubbabel, however, uh, is referred to as governor in Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. And we'll, we'll look at Haggai in a few moments' time. And he was the grandson of Jehoiakim. In other words, he was in the royal line. And he was the second last king of Judah. And uh, he led or co-led, we're not sure whether he was with Sheshbazar or whether he led his own bunch of people back to uh, Jerusalem. But according to Ezra, there were 42,360 people who returned during that particular time. And there were more. There were others who also came uh, back to Jerusalem. When you, when you go to post-exilic Judah... The returning Jews found a half-inhabited Jerusalem, uh, no walls, and made it a very unsafe place, not a nice or a, and a safe place to live, and a destroyed temple. And then they built the, the altar, and they laid the foundations for the temple. They were 
stopped do, from doing so and only completed the temple in 515. And this is the kind of picture that we need to have in our minds when we look at uh, the prophetic activity of both Haggai and Zechariah. Malachi is probably slightly later because it seems like he's referring to a temple that is in full use uh, already. Against the background um, of uh, sort of a layout of Jerusalem uh, at the time of Nehemiah. Now, let me also remind you that Nehemiah came in almost, well, yeah, almost a hundred years later than the picture that we are looking at tonight in Haggai and Zechariah. So that's almost a hundred years later. It just shows you how devastated Jerusalem was, that nobody even tried to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and it was only it was left to Nehemiah much later on uh, to do so. The prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah, uh, we need to understand as, as, as helping the exiles to resettle in the land, to rebuild not only the temple, but to rebuild the worship practices of the nation. And um, it's very clear that they predate Nehemiah uh, because both of them talk about, in fact, they give us dates and they give us information about a, a broken down temple that needed to be uh, restored. Some of the main dates related to the temple, uh, again, just a quick reminder here, uh, roughly 950, Solomon is the one who built the first temple. In 931, the kingdom is divided and the southern kingdom obviously naturally inherited the temple, so it was there in Jerusalem. Between 850 and 600, we have a succession of kings with major up, ups and downs, which is uh, actually quite phenomenal when you really think about it. Sad, because so many of the kings neglected the temple, and there was no money coming in, no, no uh, resources to help the temple actually survive, as it were. And then in 586, uh, the Babylonians destroyed the first temple, in 515, Zerubbabel completed the second temple. And then in 40, somewhere after the year 40 BC, Herod the Great was the one who extended the temple once again. And by the time of Jesus, it was a very grand and big area um, that the temple occupied. And that particular temple, the second temple, was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans under uh, Titus the general. It leads us to Haggai. Um, and essentially, Haggai encouraged the people to rebuild the temple. If you go to the book of Haggai, not a long book, but it says, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, that gives us quite a bit of information. It gives us names of the governor and the high priest at the time, and it's the exact same high priest that we have read about in the book of Zechariah. Uh, it was uh, the high priest by the name of Joshua. And then Haggai goes on. He says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house, the temple, to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for, your, for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but have harvested little. You eat but have, never have enough. And essentially Haggai is saying it's because you're not caring for the Lord's work. You're looking after yourself. You, you're working hard but not gaining anything and that's because you're not giving um, attention to the Lord's house. That's essentially what he's saying. It is possible that Haggai, whose name means my feast, was among the first return, returning exiles. We, we actually don't know, um, but we cannot confirm those details from the historical records in the book of Ezra. Uh, we can date his prophetic activity very precisely. The second year of Darius is 520 B.C. So in that year, we have Haggai talking to the people. Again, let me remind you, 538 people started coming back. They started building the temple. It is 18 years later, 16, 17, 18 years later, and the temple was still in ruins. And so now Haggai comes onto the scene and he's saying to the people, you're settling well, um, you're building your own houses, your paneled houses, but my house, the Lord's house, uh, is lying in ruins. And so he's encouraging them to actually take it up uh, and start building. 
In terms of an outline, there are four messages in the book of Haggai, a challenge to build a temple, resulting in a positive response. It's interesting that in the prophet, he's one of the few where we actually have a response to his message, where people are positively responding. Um, in uh, chapter 1, verse 12, Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord, and they started rebuilding the temple. So we actually have a great response to his preaching ministry. And then that results in chapter 2, in the promise of restoration and glory, the glory of this new temple. Obviously, they haven't seen it much, but the promise is there that the temple will be the, have the same glory that it used to have. There's a call to holiness, and then there's a promise to Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel plays quite a significant role, both in Haggai and also in the book of Zechariah. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, I find that quite interesting, uh, that the title for Zerubbabel is no king here. He is he's in a royal line, but he is not, he's not called, mentioned as a king. He is called the governor because he represents the Persian government up to this point in time. And even a hundred years later, when Nehemiah came to Jerusalem, he was a governor. So there's no talk here of king. And that leads us into the time of the intertestamental period uh, where uh, the thought of a king sort of dwindled uh, except for a short period under the Hasmoneans uh, when they did have independence. But then when the Romans took over once again, uh, again they were forced um, sort of underground as it were. And there are wonderful promises here. Tells the rubbable governor that I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. On that day, in verse 23, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. And that's how the book uh, actually ends. Uh, here is a, a picture of mini Jerusalem uh, in Jerusalem near the museum, or next to the museum, uh, with the temple right here uh, on this side. That's the temple of Herod. Uh, so what you see here is, is a representation of Jerusalem as it, as it probably would have looked like during the time of Jesus. Haggai's sole responsibility was to get people to build the temple. Uh, most of the returning or returned exiles were so preoccupied with their own doings, uh, planting and trying to make a living for themselves. Kind of logical. I mean, it, uh, they had to do something like that. Uh, get something going in terms of, of an income. Um, and his call was met with, an, with a positive response. Uh, when Haggai preached, the people responded. Um, and there is talk of spiritual renewal, but the main emphasis is actually getting the temple up and going again. The temple representing the presence of God and the blessing of God. That is uh, why it's so important to them. Um, following the time of Haggai, Haggai provides us with the exact dates of his messages, all of which dated, uh, in the sec are dated in the second year of Darius, king of Persia. That's 520. We don't know what happened to Haggai after that. Uh, we do know that the temple was eventually completed and uh, then also um, dedicated and, and completed in the year 515. No, again, there's no certainty as, as to what happened to Zerubbabel. He may have been executed or removed by King Darius in an attempt to solidify the Persian Empire. In terms of themes, what we can take from this book, the phrase in a very short book, in fact, in my NIV, it's just on an open page, on two pages, and I can look at the whole book of Haggai. The phrase, thus says the Lord, is repeated 29 times. In other words, Haggai was at pains to point out he's not speaking on his own behalf. It's not his own desire. It is God who is speaking. And the temple played a significant role representing God's presence and blessing. So as long as the, the temple is in ruins, um, the, the, the conclusion is that God is not really on our side. And so it was important for them to have this physical building uh, reconstructed. The destruction of the temple was totally inconceivable. The, the Jews never thought it would happen. 
Um, the book of Lamentations, I've referred to several times, um, shows you how devastated the nation was. So now they, they had an opportunity to rebuild the temple and build it back up so that uh, God's blessing will, be, will return uh, to them. Here is a full sort of frontal photo of that uh, mini version of the temple. Uh, the whole mini Jerusalem has been built with Jerusalem stone. Uh, little, literally, literally small little white stones. Um, uh, you, even, even today in Jerusalem, you don't just go ahead and, and build anything and paint it pink. Um, you, you don't do that. There's a sort of a, a, an architectural sort of bylaws that govern the way you build, what sort of material you use, uh, and so on. So this whole mini temple, uh, this mini Jerusalem has been built from Jerusalem stone, as they, they call it, white uh, stone. The destruction of the temple represented God's judgment. When the exiles allowed God um, to, to use them to rebuild the temple, it was like the blessing of God was returning uh, to them. And Haggai's emphasis on the rebuilding of the temple should be seen in the light of his call to holiness. Um, we should not think of Haggai only focusing on the temple. There is a call to holiness, but it's because the temple represented the presence of God. And as long as the temple isn't there, it was like uh, God's covenant people was uh, at sea. Some of the passages, the, the message that Haggai preached, he tells us the story in a certain sense, a uh, promise of blessing, and then I've read part of the promise to Zerubbabel. Now, before we look at Zechariah, we're going to take a short break, uh, and then we'll come back to the book of Zechariah. Okay, uh, we're back, and we're going to look at the book of Zechariah. Even from this brief little summary, you will see that Zechariah ministers in the same time or during the same time as the prophet Haggai, uh, starting his ministry in the year 520, or at least the ministry that he had, uh, is dated in the year 520. And this is what it says, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius. If you just simply turn back the page, it says, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, and here we, we have, in the eighth month, of the second year of Darius. So literally two months later, we have at least one of the prophecies of Zechariah. And so that gives you a very clear picture of two prophets operating virtually the same time uh, in the land of Judah at that time. It was a contemporary of Haggai. Ministry started a mere two months after that of Haggai. And it's possible that the two prophets... Uh, continue to encourage the people until the temple was completed, although that particular story is not told to us necessarily, but they would, they would have had a ministry. Not everything they said, uh, not everything the prophets said um, was necessarily written down. The last dated prophecy, prophecy from Zechariah is in 518, so a rough two years after that uh, is the last time he dates it. Now, whether that's the last of his prophecies, we, we are not sure about that. In terms of the book of Zechariah, his ministry, um, the book is much longer than that of Haggai. In fact, uh, several chapters, if you page through it, you, you'll page about three, four, five pages to get to the end of the book of Zechariah. His main focus was far more on the spiritual renewal that was necessary. Whereas Haggai came in from a more physical temple angle, Zechariah came in from a spiritual a revival angle, and it's necessary for people to serve God, to be holy, um, and otherwise God, God's presence. The temple itself is not going to save them. It is the people serving God, it is the people worshiping God that is important. And, and again, I need to emphasize that from an Old Testament perspective, the physical temple played a massive role. When, you, when we move into the New Testament, we have a different view of the temple now. We the New Testament clearly says that I, my own personal body as a Christian, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We also hear that the church of Jesus Christ is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God dwells in that. And in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no temple because God is present. God is always there. So there's a new perspective on the whole thing from a New Testament um, angle. However, Going back into the Old Testament, it was important for the temple to physically represent uh, the presence of God. So in a certain sense, Zechariah had a much more difficult task. I think any pastor will tell you it is probably easier to get a physical church building built and raise money for that 
than actually raise money for missions or for revival or uh, help people to change their lives. Uh, that is the far more difficult task. And so one can identify with Zechariah and the difficulty that he faced. His name, the prophet's name, Zechariah, means Yahweh has remembered. Very appropriate uh, name because as he, it may be that he was born sort of right towards the end of the exile and maybe there was hope that something is going to change and his parents said uh, Yahweh has remembered and certainly now they can look back and his name would be almost prophetically come true uh, in that God has actually remembered them and here they are they're all the way back from the exile and they're busy building the temple. Zechariah is introduced as the son of Berechiah the son of Edo um, a listing that is similar to that in Nehemiah um, it says, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edo. Now, when you go back to uh, Nehemiah, there's a list of different people and names. And Edo's name is actually listed right there. So there's another bit of a connection uh, that we have. Edo was a priest, and he returned from captivity under uh, Zerubbabel, Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 4. That's where we read about him as well. And Zechariah was therefore a priest who also functioned as a prophet. He was certainly not the only one to have done so. Um, then probably um, uh, Isaiah was one of those. It may be that Ezekiel was a priest. Uh, so several uh, of the prophets were actually priests as well, uh, which means that God uh, literally called anybody. Um, Amos was a farmer, uh, a priest. There was a, a royal person. And, and so uh, you would have many different kind of people who would become prophets as well. In terms of the book itself, the writing of the book, it provides us with the dates, the second year and the fourth year of Darius. That's uh, 520 to 518. The tone and the contents uh, of chapters 9 to 14 are different from chapters 1 to 8, uh, but not unlike the, uh, what we have seen in others. Uh, there are scholars who would argue perhaps that we have two different authors here, but um, they, they have no grounds to, to really prove that um, emphatically. The writing of the book could have taken place shortly after the prophecies were uttered, uh, or received by the prophet. We, we never told whether he wrote it down himself or whether someone else did it. And chapters 1 to 8 could have been written before the completion of the temple because there's still some projection into the future and the blessing of God. That would make sense because if, uh, if he started preaching in 520, then he also wrote those prophecies down or someone wrote it down before the completion of the temple. Uh, because in those chapters we don't see the completed temple yet. Maybe that the later chapters uh, happened uh, at some other point in time. In terms of an outline, chapter 1, there's an introduction and a call to repentance. This is how he starts. He says, The Lord was very angry with your forefathers. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says, Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your forefathers, to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways, your evil practices, but they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your forefathers now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your forefathers? Then they repented and said, The Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve just as he determined to do. So again, it's like um, some of the other prophets who reach back into the history and saying, we've seen this before. The, the Lord had spoken exact way before. Now he's speaking again to us. In chapter 1, verse 7, uh, we have the first of visions. It simply says, on the 24th day of the 11th month, the, lunth, the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah. During the night I had a vision. And then he starts describing those visions. Um, and several of them. There is a, um, a, a horseman. There are horns and craftsmen. A measuring line. Joshua the high priest. The one that I read earlier on at the beginning of the lecture tonight. A flying scroll. A woman in a basket. And four chariots. So it's different kind of visions. Uh, each one of them probably with a different kind of message. And then chapter 7 to 8. The messages to the nation about justice, mercy and peace. And then chapters 9 to 14, far more general sort of oracles, uh, prophecies to the nation about several different kinds of things. If you go to the material, you will find that not all of them are written in poetic style. 
There are a couple of chapters where it's more poetically written, but others are not, uh, which means that he had different kinds of um, um, dif- uh, uh, words or ways in which he conveyed his messages to the nation. In terms of Zechariah's message, he rebuked the people for following the ways of their forefathers, um, and surely they must have known, they must have, they must have seen what their forefathers did. People like Manasseh and Ammon, I've referred to earlier on, surely they must have known about those people and how evil they were. Nehemiah and others referred to this. Daniel referred to that. They, in fact, uh, there are beautiful chapters in both Nehemiah and in Daniel where they confess the sins of their forefathers. Zechariah is reminding the people that this destruction came upon us because of our sins, and we shouldn't be going in the same uh, direction if we want God to bless us. And so his emphasis is on the spiritual renewal, as I said before. In terms of the structure of Zechariah, the book divides into two major sections, chapters 1 to 8, uh, and then chapters 9 to 14. Chapters 9 to 14 are more eschatological in nature, in other words, more future-related. Uh, eschatology is the study of the end times. Some biblical scholars have seen a possible uh, chiastic, uh, sort of a crossover structure uh, in the book of, um, of, of Zechariah. A chiastic structure is typically where you have an A, a B, and a B, and an A, where the A's would correspond and the B's would correspond, which is why they call it chiastic from the Greek word or the Greek letter, uh, chi, which is like, looks like an X uh, in our language, but it's actually a ch sound uh, in, uh, in the, the Greek. Some of the themes that we find in Zechariah, a strong call to repentance, visions of the coming Messiah, pronouncements of judgment, if there is no repentance. And here is the theme that I want to highlight and want to bring to the fore again. In fact, we've seen it several times now. When there is repentance, God will send His blessing. Uh, God may even pronounce judgment, but the moment people hear the judgment, they, they um, respond to that in repentance and turning from their sin, It's like clockwork in the Bible. God will turn around and bless them. He will then take His judgment away. And so that's the call by so many uh, of the prophets. And then right towards the end, the latter chapters of Zechariah, uh, the theme of God's control of the end times. God is ultimately in control, not only over the whole world right now, but also in time. At the end, God will bring about His own kingdom, something that we really believe uh, from a New Testament perspective as well. Some of the passages to read, the call to repentance, Joshua, the high priest before God, uh, the throne, that is in chapter 3, a call for social reform, a foreshadowing of Jesus on the donkey. I don't know how many of you uh, remember or recognize um, that in the book of Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, Your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And that we find in chapter 9, verse 9. And then there's another reference in the New Testament to Zechariah in chapter 12, verses 10 to 14. There's a reference to the one that they have pierced. And and, um, in Revelation, uh, it is seen as a, prophecy which has been fulfilled when they, when they pierce Jesus at, uh, on the cross. And then in Revelation, uh, they, those very same people, and, and they represent the evil people or the sinful people in the whole world and through all ages, they will see the one that they have pierced. And so that also came into fulfillment. It takes us to the very last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. Malachi, in many respects, represents God's last official uh, speaking, God's last word, as it were. Um, And it was a message of love and hope in a time of spiritual decline. And it happened subsequent to 515. As I said, by 515, the temple was dedicated. And so now it seems like the temple and the worship in the temple were all functioning quite well. Uh, Well, at least in terms of uh, the letter of the law. Uh, and going through the motions, and this is where Malachi uh, kicks in. Malachi simply starts his uh, book by saying, uh, or it says, an oracle. 
the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. It represents the last time God spoke officially, um, as it were. Uh, There were other books, as we now know from our study in the first module. We call them um, the Apocrypha. Uh, They help us with some of the history in the intertestamental period. But both Jews and Christians do not recognize the Apocrypha as official word of God. And so Malachi, in that sense, really represented that last word of God to the nation. The word Malachi in Hebrew means my messenger. And there is no other name like Malachi anywhere in the Old Testament or in Hebrew. And so many people have, many scholars have uh, come to the conclusion that it's actually not a name, not a, uh, a proper name, but really just it means my messenger or my angel. Uh, Whether that's true or not, I think most of us just accept the fact that he probably was a person by the name um, Malachi. It doesn't mean that if the name doesn't occur anywhere else that there wasn't a a proper name like that. I know that many parents may uh, name their children all sorts of weird names that I have never heard in my life before. That does not mean that they don't exist. But Jewish tradition regarded Malachi as a member of uh, what has become known as the Great Synagogue. It was a council of leaders who helped reorganize the Jewish community after the return uh, from the exile. And this great assembly, also known as the Great Synagogue, or the men of the Great Assembly, was an assembly of 120 rabbis, um, and is not 100% sure when the rabbis came into existence. We know from the Old Testament prior to the destruction of Jerusalem that there was the temple, the priests, uh, kings, prophets, But the concept of rabbis is something that only really developed during the intertestamental period. By the time Jesus was here, uh, it was a well-known phenomenon. Um, But the the Jews go all the way back uh, to uh, the return from the exile. And because there was no king, uh, and because it was such a disorganized bunch, they needed some guidance and so on. And hence, the system, a political uh, organizational system developed to help the Jews to resettle back back in the land. The Jews believe that this group of leaders gave advice. They guided the nation in all government and spiritual matters, basically fulfilling the role of the king and functioning as a sort of a bridge between uh, the the royal era, the era of the kings, the monarchy, and the time of the rabbis. And ultimately, in the New Testament, what we find is the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin in the New Testament is the one that really organized the Jewish uh, faith and the Jewish nation as such, under a king that was appointed, not their own king, but a king or a governor appointed by the Romans at that particular time. In terms of the writing of Malachi, um, much of the debate around the date of writing revolves um, around whether the title Malachi refers to a person or as just a a name, more like a, a noun. It's not clear whether Malachi wrote his own prophecies or someone else has done so later on. Uh, but the placing of the, of the book of the Old Testament does not necessarily mean that it was the last one to have been written. Uh, he certainly represents the last of the historical section and the prophetic section in the Old Testament. But the, it could be that uh, the chronicler, for example, wrote his stuff later than that of Malachi, but that, again, we're not sure about. In terms of the date of Malachi, um, I've already said that it is definitely post the dedication of the temple, and a technical scientific analysis of the Hebrew language here, which is not something that I can do, uh, but it points to a time uh, somewhere in the 6th century prior to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, that is an interesting uh, take on it, because by and large, uh, I have grown up believing that Malachi was the last of all of the Old Testament development. But there is a possibility that Malachi actually ministered before Ezra and Nehemiah came onto the scene. Uh, If he lived and ministered around 500, then he certainly would predate Nehemiah, because Nehemiah only came in 445 uh, BC. So um, there's just a very interesting uh, take on that. Other references, such as the Son of Righteousness in chapter 4, verse 2, as well as the developing theology of life after death in Jewish thought, also date from the Persian era and not from the later Greek era. So that would also push him slightly earlier. 
There are some conservative scholars who date the book 500 to 475, and then others see it as 400 or even later. Uh, and you would have some more liberal people, liberal scholars who would date it 300 or even 250 or uh, whatever. I would sort of tend to go to an earlier date for Malachi, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's either 500 or 400. It's quite a, it's quite a difference uh, in time, but uh, we cannot be too emphatic about that. Background, the background of Malachi, his messages and his approach reflect the period of decline. Um, it seems like it predates Ezra and Nehemiah at this time, uh, where, where there was a decline and people settled back. It's not unusual because even already in Haggai, we saw the people settling in their own homes and not giving attention to the temple. So that was quite uh, normal. We pick up the exact same story in Ezra. We pick it up again in Nehemiah. Uh, where people neglected the worship of God and serving God. And that is just a, a story that repeated itself over and over. Um, it proved the fact that the physical temple was no guarantee for spiritual renewal. And um, that, that's where the Jews in the Old Testament went wrong. They felt as long as there is a temple, God is on our side. Well, then the temple was destroyed. So the logical conclusion is God is not on our side. Uh, and that is not necessarily true, uh, because religion, uh, or worshipping God, perhaps I should say, is not just a religion. It is a relationship with God, and that comes out in the Old Testament. More specifically, we believe from a New Testament perspective, that needs to be uh, emphasized. The people expected the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah was not forthcoming, not according to them. Uh, and Malachi, therefore, begins to represent something of the transition from an Old Testament monarchy situation to that of the rabbinic Sanhedric, uh, Sanhedrin's uh, uh, time or phase that we find in the New Testament. During the time of Malachi, the Jews were a small and insignificant group, a small part of the bigger world picture. Um, and there was the struggle between the Persian Empire and the Greek Empire. There's some interesting stories in extra-biblical literature, uh, even movies made about all of these things, about the, the wars between Persia and, Greek and, and, all, and Greece and, all, and so on. Uh, but Malachi serves as a reminder that the Messianic age had not yet arrived, but remained a future promise. And that is one of the things that he highlighted uh, in his book. It consists of the book itself of six oracles, prophecies if you wish. They are surrounded by an introduction as we have read already and then the concluding marks in chapter 4 verses 4 to 6. And the six oracles contain wonderful, wonderful stories and, and messages. The first is one of love. And let me just read that to you. It says in verse 2 of chapter 1, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? And then the, the response comes, was not Esau Jacob's brother, the Lord says, Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I, ha I have hated, and I have turned his mountain into a wasteland, and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Now, this may be a reference to what we, we referred to last time with the Edomites, because Esau was the forefather of the Edomites. So, around about 500, or between 500 and 400, uh, the Edomites sort of ceased to exist as an entity, as a nation in itself, having been infiltrated, uh, the country being infiltrated by, by Arab nations. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild uh, the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people under the wrath of, law, of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. In other words, that control of God once again. But, but really what God is highlighting is His love for Jacob. Now, immediately I'm frowning and I'm thinking, why does God hate Esau? Why, why the strong language? Interesting thing. When you were dating um, two sisters, you, you, sort of, you, you have one of them uh, in the eye, as it were, um, and, and you were... You were looking at them and making a choice or a decision as to whether you're going to go for sister A or sister B eventually. It's a Hebraic expression. If you eventually decide, I'm going to take A, then you would say, I love A, I hate B. Uh, 
In other words, the one you do not choose is the one you hate. And you now need to see hate in inverted commas. So it's the direct opposite. Uh, I love A and therefore I hate B. And that's the context of Esau Jacob uh, over here in Malachi. There are lovely pictures uh, that Malachi uses to explain God's relationship with his people. God is Israel's father. He's de he desires true worship. And yet Israel doesn't give him the worship that belongs to him. Again, there's the picture of marriage. It is in this particular context that we have that one statement that we often quote, God hates divorce. And uh, it's because Israel is his bride, like uh, Hosea has pointed out to us. And, but, but Israel turned her back on God, and God says, I do not want to divorce you. I hate divorce. So it's a spiritual context, number one which we do believe we can apply to the covenant relationship that there is between a, a, a man and a, and, a, and a wife, a man and a woman uh, in marriage. God is just. He expects honesty. God is faithful. He expects genuine worship. And God desires uh, honesty from His nation. The message of Malachi, one of the characteristics of Malachi is a number of questions. There are ten questions in total. Uh, I love you. How do you love us? Um, and so on. I mean, there are plenty of questions over here. Um, there's one in, in verse uh, 6 and 7. It says, It is you, O priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, How have we showed contempt for your name? You place defiled food on the altar. But you ask, How have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? And so on. So it's one of the characteristics of Malachi. God engages his nation by asking. He's asking them questions. He allows them to ask questions and in response uh, to them. The major focus in the book is that of a covenant or the covenant relationship that God has with his people and the implications of the covenant for the nation as seen in some of the references. There's a covenant with Levi, the priest or the priestly function. There's, a, there's the covenant of father. God is a father, a father with his children. There is the covenant of marriage, a man and a, and a wife, a man and a woman together. And God uses those as images to explain his relationship with his own people. There's an expectation of a response. God, through Malachi, expected the people to show some responses, such as purification of a corrupt and complacent priesthood. It seems like the priests were already functioning, but they were, they were corrupt. They, um, they were skimpy in what they offered to God. They kept the best of the animals for themselves, and so on. Worship must be changed from the mechanical style to true praise offered to God. Respect for God must be shown in proper tithes. Um, here is another famous, famous quote. Bring the full tithe to the storehouse and see whether I will bless you or how I will bless you. That comes from the book of Malachi. And then broken family relationships and social justice must be uh, restored. Those are some of the uh, main messages of Malachi. And themes, similar, God's love for his people. Religious reform and revival is necessary. Social reform must be evident in every aspect of society. Marriage and divorce provide a picture of God's relationship. And then we have another very famous quote from the book, and that we also pick, pick up again in the uh, New Testament, and that is Elijah uh, the prophet. In chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, and this is how the book ends, and how the Old Testament ends. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. There's the day of the Lord again. It's a dreadful one. Before that day comes, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. Now, there's a whole, during the four, five hundred years since Malachi and the coming of Jesus, obviously, there were generations of people and, and people who studied the Word of God. And the Jewish scholars poured over the Scriptures to find out what is God saying? When is God going to speak again? And they came up with the concept of the Messiah based on the Word of God. They also came to this particular passage and they believed that Elijah would come and he would prepare the way for the Messiah. And so um, they, they looked at Elijah as a true sample or true example of a prophet. 
um, one who would confront evil. He's not necessarily very popular. He's a bit weird. Um, he performs miracles and he prepares the way for God to work. And then based on Malachi's reference, the Jewish tradition developed the theology of an Elijah type person who would come. So when John the Baptist came, they, one of the questions to John was by the Pharisees or the, the, the religious leaders, are you Elijah? Are you the one that we're expecting? Are you the Messiah? Uh, to all those, John said, no. And then Jesus asked his disciples who the people say I am. One of the responses was Elijah the prophet. Some people say, you are Elijah uh, the prophet. And then Jesus said, but you, who, who do you say I am? And then Peter responded to say, you, the Christ, the, the Christ of, of God. Now, Jesus then explained to his disciples when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration and they came down, they saw Elijah with Moses uh, on the mountain. And as they came down, the disciples quizzed Jesus on that. Why do the Pharisees say that Elijah must come? And Jesus said, they correct. Elijah must come, but I tell you, he's already come. And... Uh, he, they then understood that he was referring to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was an Elijah-like person uh, in the same kind of vein. Bit weird, bit strange, living out there, uh, eating hojas and stuff, and wearing all sorts of strange clothes, uh, and, and announcing the kingdom of God and baptizing people. And in that way, he prepared the hearts of the people for the coming Messiah. Uh, and so that is where Elijah the prophet uh, stepped into the picture. Passages to read in Malachi, God's love for Israel, chapter 1, uh, we read that as already. And then true worship, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, um, and let's, let's read that. Uh, it says, Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors, you see the temple is in existence, so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty. And I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations, from the rising to the setting of the sun. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to my name, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. It's a beautiful picture here of what became true in the New Testament and ultimately will, be, uh, will, will reach its final consummation when Jesus comes back and in heaven and all those uh, people will be, uh, our nations will be for God. The tithing issue is mentioned in chapter 3, verses 6 to 12, and then the coming Elijah I have referred to already. By way of conclusion, this brings us to the end of our Old Testament study, um, and I want to congratulate you for hanging in there and studying with me all 39 books of the Old Testament. I trust that you enjoyed it. It's only a peak view. I could only give you so much scratch the surface uh, your job now is to go read the Bible and read it with other helps with you and read right through the Old Testament. And, and hopefully the historical picture will put the Bible into perspective for you so that when you read it, you can make the connection with those different people. And more specifically, the prophetic literature. I spend quite a bit of time on that because uh, it is such an unknown section of the Old Testament to most of us. And I trust that you've enjoyed uh, the introduction to that. What's next? Well... The survey of the New Testament is next. Uh, we're going to study that, um, and we'll look at every one of the 27 books of the uh, New Testament. I'll have a little, little bit more time when it comes to the New Testament to actually expand a bit more and, and give you more of the message of every book. And then in the last module, we'll take one step back and say, okay, so how does this all fit together? What do we believe? Uh, now that we've gone through the individual books, if you take them all together... What do we know about God? What do we learn about Jesus? What do we learn about the Spirit? What do we know about the church? What about sin and mankind? And so that's what we'll do in that last one, and I call it the big picture, because then we'll look at that big picture uh, from a biblical perspective. So I, I trust that you will enjoy your break as you prepare uh, to come back for the study of the New Testament, and I trust that you will come back and, um, and journey through the New Testament with me. May the Lord bless you. And thank you for hanging in there.